some fun with this one. Six mil bonds on PME systems. Six millimeter squared bonds on PME earthing systems. And can we carry out additions or alterations on the electrical installation when they're in place instead of the respective 10 millimeter squares, what they should be? One thing I want to make clear, this video is about carrying out new electrical work on existing systems when they've got existing six millimeter squared bonding conductors in place. And if you're installing new bonding conductors to a PME system, under no circumstance should that conductor be anything less than 10 millimeter squared. This is an incredibly in-depth topic. So if you're watching this, I'm going to assume that you know what main protective bonding is, what earthing systems in this country are, how ADS works, and how prospective earth fault current works. I'd also like to point out that with all my documents at the ready to look at this subject, a lot of them have come in reference from NIC EIC, who I'm registered with. And I would like to point out now that in no way, shape or form am I challenging them in what they've published, what they might have written or the answers they have given. It's my belief that the NIC EIC and other governing bodies that you might be registered with are at the forefront of this problem because we look to them for the answers. You cannot make this up. My whiteboard has just turned up, so that is absolutely perfect for this video. Just in time. So what do the actual regulations state on this subject? Additions and alterations to an installation. No addition or alteration, temporary or permanent, shall be made to an existing installation unless it has been ascertained that the rating and the condition of any existing equipment, including that of the distributor, will be adequate for the altered circumstances. Furthermore, the earthing and bonding arrangements, if necessary for the protective measure applied for the safety of an addition or alteration, shall be adequate. In previous regulations, 6 mil bonds on PME systems might have been the going thing and considered accurate the minimum size that you can install. So what's changed? We're going to play a little game throughout the course of this video. We're going to take two types of electricians, one that will go into an existing installation and alter the installation on six mil bonds in place. We're going to call these the six millers. And for people that would go into someone's home and say, no, under no circumstances am I putting anything in, unless the bonds are of the minimum size specified in the current edition of the regulations, we're going to call these type of people the 10 millers. So we've got a game here, six mils versus the 10 millers. So who's going to win? The first place that I looked for the answer, I rang the NIC EIC technical helpline and asked them this question. And this was the answer they gave me. Obviously I didn't record it for obvious reasons, but this is what they said to me. Under no circumstances should a bonding conductor on any PME system be less than 10 millimetres squared. So that for me is one nil to the 10 millimetres. This is called Connections. It's a magazine that I get free from the NIC EIC every three months or so, covering subjects, topics and products throughout the industry at the time. So what do they say from the helpline? We continue with our series of answers to some of the more frequently asked questions put to our technical helpline. And funnily enough, this is at the top of the questions. <clears throat> when the main protective bonding conductors to extraneous conductive parts, incoming water and gas services and the like in an existing installation have a cross-sectional area of 6 mil squared and the earthing system is TNCS, PME, is it permissible to carry out any alterations or additions to the electrical installations, such as replacing the consumer unit or installing additional circuits without upgrading the bonding arrangements. What did they say? No, full stop. They gave their reasons why, but they're pretty self-explanatory. So far, the 10 minutes are absolutely running away with this one. At the end of my first NIC assessment, my examiner said to me, are there any questions that I would like to ask him that he could answer while he was there? And funnily enough, a drum roll, I asked him about six mil bonds and PME systems and can I make additions or alterations to the installation with them in place rather than 10 millimeter squared conductors. And he pointed me to the electrical safety first best practice guide to refer to that 
So let's go have a look at what they've got to say. Now I've not printed out the full documentation. This is available online if you want to go view it. But this is the electrical installation condition reporting, classification codes for domestic and similar electrical installations. Now you might ask what's that got to do with making additions and alterations to an existing circuit. But this is something that they say on page 18. Non-compliances with the current edition of BS7671 that do not give rise to danger and do not require reporting. Inadequate cross-sectional area of a main protective body conductor provided that the conductor is at least six millimeters squared and there is no evidence of thermal damage. On the basis that that says does not give rise to danger, I'm going to give one point to the six millers. So we're now at a score of two one to the ten millers. Now you might say to me, but that didn't state on PME systems. It could be TT or TNS. It didn't state PME, which is fair enough. However, this is another document that I found also published by the Electrical Safety First. This is frequently asked questions in the electrical industry. And here's what I found. Question 67. When carrying out electrical work on an installation forming part of a TNCS system, is it necessary to upgrade existing 6mm squared protective equipment potential bonding to 10mm squared? Not necessarily. If the 6mm bonding connects all the extraneous conductive parts to the main earthing terminal, has been in place for a significant time and shows no signs of thermal damage, then it may not require to be upgraded. Once again, one point to the six millers, so an out of score of two two. Now it's fair enough to say that the 10 millers points have more value because they're coming from NIC EIC and not a um, electrical safety first best practice guide that you can find online. However, these following organisations, you can see search short NIC, EIC among them, it states the electrical safety first is indebted to the following organisations for their contribution and or support to the development of this guide. So they're saying that NIC, EIC have put, made some input to this guide. It goes on to say this is one of a series of best practice guides produced by Electrical Safety First in association with leading industry bodies for the benefit of electrical contractors and installers and their customers. Also got a little dot there, so if we follow that, Electrical Safety First, formerly the National Inspection Council for Electrical Installation Contracting, NIC EIC. So both these scores have come from NIC EIC publications or from their technical helpline. So whose score holds more value, the 6 millers or the 10 millers? It's very confusing at this point to make a determination on who's correct. So I'm going to go back and look in the regs to see if I can find anything else pointing me to the right direction and the right answer. I found myself in chapter 54 of the regulations and back to what I said earlier, it clearly states here that the minimum size bonding conductor on PME systems at the minimum should be 10 mil. Let's have a look at what they say over here. Except where PME conditions apply, a main protective bonding conductor shall have a cross-sectional area not less than half the cross-sectional area required for the earthing conductor of the installation and not less than 6 mm squared. Fair enough, so they're talking about TT and TNS systems here. So what's the big idea with PME? I'd like to point here that it says the cross-sectional area of every protective conductor, so they're also talking about the main earthing conductor, other than a protective bonding conductor shall be calculated in accordance with regulation 543.1.3 or selected in accordance with regulation 543.1.4. So rather than select the minimum sized earthy conductor that I need for an installation, I can actually calculate the size that I need and go from there. So the size that it says in the table in the book is 16 millimeters squared as a minimum, generally in domestic. But I'm gonna calculate what actual size I need for the installation that I'm in at the minute. And that means I'm going to be doing some math. Ah, the old adiabatic equation where S is equal to the square root of I squared times T over K. 
where S is the CSA of the conductor, I is the perspective air felt current, T is time taken for the overcurrent protective device to disconnect the supply, and K is a value given in relation to any D ratings of current carrying capacity of the conductor. So I'm going to go off and obtain some of these values and put them in the equation and see what I come up with for the minimum CSA of the earthy conductor required for this PME installation. Okay, here I am going to obtain the PEFC of the installation. The meter has been zeroed, the leads have been zeroed, so I don't know if you could pick it up, but there you go. Just so no one argues this isn't a fair test. And the reading I've got for PEFC is 1.7 kA. Okay, I've got a 100 amp 1361 type 2 fuse installed in the head of my installation. So let's see how long that might take to trip with a PEFC of 1.7 kA. I can see here that that fuse will blow in 0.1 of a second with a uh, 1450 uh, amps flowing through it at fault. So I'm going to use the figure 0.1 seconds, which I think is fair enough. And finally, we'll get the value for K. Now I've got a 16 millimeter squared conductor going through the cavity of the wall. I don't think it's a bunch of any other cables because it's not in any form of ducting. So I'm going to assume that it's flowing in free air. It's copper so i believe that i can use the figure of one four three given there it's one three three when it's above 300 mil although this is nowhere near 300 mil okay i've had to move the board because the sun settings unfortunately and you won't be able to see it in the reflection of the light but here's the figures that i've got so i need to do the mathematical formula 1700 squared times 0.1 square root of all that and then divide it by 143 then i'll have the minimum sized csa of a copper conductor that i need for this installation so with all that in place i've got an answer of 3.75 mil um the next size up for a cable that's not mechanically protected as mine's going through the wall without mechanical protection is four millimeters squared now this is a pme system but let's forget that for the minute. So I need a four mil squared copper conductor as a minimum for the earthing system. The regulations state, other than PME systems, but let's forget that for the minute, that the main protective body conductor should be not lower than the minimum required earth in conductor for the installation and not less than six millimeters squared. So why do we need a minimum of 10 millimeters squared copper conductor protective bonding for PME systems. I've got to be quick because I'm losing the light. This is the site guide published by NICEIC and they say this. They say protective bonding conductors in PME supplied installations may have to carry sustained currents under certain distribution network conditions which may give rise the temperature of the bonding conductors. Where PME conditions apply, the electricity distributor may have particular requirements for bonding conductors above and beyond those in BS7671. Okay, fair enough. I'm guessing this is where the thermal damage um, on the existing conductors comes into play. But you might walk in somewhere and see that there's no damage, fair enough. But what's to say that there might be a problem in the future? Okay, I'm going to conclude this video here. I've looked at this subject completely objectively and given opinions on both of a 6 miller and both of a 10 miller. Um, well done if you've managed to watch this video the whole way through. I'd have got bored about a minute and a half into it. It's a long-winded video, but well worth it if you are a self-employed electrician and want to know what um, other people in the industry might think about this complicated topic. Even Bailey's bored here, bless him. I'd like to state one more time that I hope I've not offended anyone working for the NRC EIC. It's not been my intention to pull them up on anything that they might have said. 
they are contradicting themselves any way, shape or form. Um, I hope that no one comes after me. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you've learned something from it and I'll see you on the next in-depth topic that I choose to film.